Morning, gang. Uh, book of Nehemiah, and we'll stay there for a while, I think, Lord willing. Uh, take a look at some lessons from the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> so this morning, <clears throat> we're in Nehemiah uh, chapter 1, and uh, we'll read like verses 1 through 3, something like that. And uh, the series is called uh, Nehemiah Rising from the Rubble. We want to talk about failure a little bit today. Uh, just to sort of preload the, the discussion, failure, what do you do with failure? Have you ever failed? Sure, surely, we all have. Um, how does that fit the context of, of Nehemiah uh, and the like? So Nehemiah 1, beginning at verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that uh, Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile concerning Jerusalem, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates destroyed by fire. <clears throat> so, the book of Nehemiah, usually uh, when we use an expression like to rise from the rubble, uh, we're kind of talking about something figuratively in that sense, uh, you know, correcting what's wrong, correcting what's gone wrong, correcting some mistake that we've made, rebuilding what lies in ruins to new heights of usefulness. But in this case, in the case of Nehemiah, the expression is quite literal. Actually, you could apply both of these. Uh, but it but it does have a literal root to it. <clears throat> so, you know, r r raising these fallen stones uh, amidst all of this rubble of a fallen wall uh, would still follow the same pattern of past mistakes, past failures, uh, things of that nature. So just, just to speak about failure and to round it out and give it sort of a fuller understanding what we're talking about, I mean, in general terms, right? So, so failure is like not to succeed at something, obviously, but um, it is a harsh reality of life, for one thing. <clears throat> so none of us can really escape it, so it's a universally human experience. So, so we, we get that. Uh, failure offers the opportunity to either learn from our mistakes or to be destroyed by them. Uh, failure can be a gateway to new beginnings, can be a gateway to restoration. Failure can be also uh, foundational. You say, well, can it ever be a positive thing? So it can be foundational, uh, or maybe even we'd say it's necessary for achieving greater results. So while on the one hand, we don't advocate failing, but on the other hand, you know, we shouldn't, sh shouldn't just be looking uh, all too <laughs> negatively about it either. So failure shows us what we would not otherwise <clears throat> have seen, uh, you know, that is in terms of what we wouldn't otherwise but for failure that we could accomplish, <clears throat> and uh, at least in the sense of, of what maybe is now uh, possible but would otherwise be not possible but for the failure. So most people, in fact, fear failure. I mean, if they hear that, nobody says, yes, yeah, sign me up. I want to be the first one in line to fail. Uh, but, but a lot of folks just, just fear it, you know. So, you know, obviously if you fear failure, then you're not going to try anything. Or when something is perceived to be uh, beyond your <clears throat> abilities, the limits of your abilities, say, well, you know, no, I'm, I'm not going to attempt that because to attempt that would mean certain failure. So some people also uh, fail rather magnificently, <laughs> Only, only to be so overcome by humiliation and embarrassment that they run from the mess rather than face the mess, learn from it, uh, take responsibility for it, and move on uh, from it. <clears throat> so this might be what we call, not originally with me, but failing forward, if you will. I found this of Abraham Lincoln. It's not new to anyone, you know, but uh, it's, worth, it's just worth noting if, if someone could... So you fail, but... How many times before you say, that's it, I, I'm out? <laughs> How many times? <clears throat> so uh, this particular version uh, says he was, he was seven years old. Uh, his family was, we're talking about Abraham Lincoln, seven years old. His family was forced out of their home because of some legal technicality. He had to work to help support them at seven. At nine, uh, he lost his mother. 
22, he lost his job as a store clerk. He wanted to go to law school, so on, so on. Uh, 23, he went, he went into debt to partner with somebody else in a, in a business, and three years later, his business partner dies, leaving him with this massive debt that would take him years to come out of. 28, uh, he develops a romantic relationship with a, with a young woman. He had, he had four years invested into this, asked her to marry him. She said, she said no, <laughs> so he had this kind of uh, heartache as well. 37, on his third try, he was finally elected to Congress. Two years later, he ran again, failed to be reelected at 41, adding additional heartache to an unhappy marriage. His four-year-old son dies. Uh, next year, he's re rejected for a land officer position. At 45, he runs for Senate, loses again. Two years later, he was defeated uh, in his nomination for vice president. 49, he ran for Senate again, lost again. 51, he's elected president of the United States, second term in office cut short, and we all know why. Uh, interesting, though, that at his uh, bedside, when he was pronounced dead, his uh, former kind of detractor, Edwin Stanton, who would be the uh, Secretary of War, uh, <clears throat> basically does a, what, what we would say a, a tweet out today, you know, would tweet this if this was available. He says, now he belongs to the ages. Though his detractor had great respect for him, As a matter of fact, uh, thereafter, any time Lincoln's name was mentioned in his presence, he would just weep uncontrollably. Um, so failure, you know, so there's an example of someone who's, at, at what point do you, do, you, do you fail maybe and do it magnificently, or maybe you would think of yourself as, as Lincoln might have. Um, it's not my fault, I'm the victim. Like how many of those things was he just on the receiving end? You wouldn't necessarily see your... Your, your four-year-old dies, what, what fault was that of his? But nonetheless, um, just, to, just to experience failure on the one hand, heartache on the other, disappointment, so on and so forth. So we come to Nehemiah, and his name um, means God comforts, something to that effect. So his parents uh, likely gave him the name uh, because of the times in which they lived. You know, this would be the times of the, the exile. For example, and, and that's mentioned in those few verses. We'll talk about that in just a second. But look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1. So Nehemiah, uh, whose name means, you'll see the, the uh, yeah, ia, ia at the end, ia at the end of Nehemiah and of, of Hakaliah. Of course, I'm not pronouncing them precisely like they are in the Hebrew, but in the Hebrew, this is, this is the Lord. So there's the Lord somewhere in, in there, or the Lord comforts. You know, so the parents naming him the Lord comforts. And, and you get this, in, and I would say, who knows, but I would say because they're living in an age where they're oppressed in a foreign land, they've been taken into captivity, things are just not looking good. If you thought you were going to get out of this after a year, two years or something, this just keeps going on and on and on and on. Um, but in, in chapter 1, verse 1, you, say, you see uh, Hakalia uh, as being his father's name, which, you know, again, what does it mean? Uh, we don't have a lot of information on, in there, but some think it means like to wait confidently on God or wait confidently on the Lord. It seems to fit, right? Because if you're, if you're going through it, you know, you're going through a tough situation and it just doesn't go away, doesn't go away, doesn't go away. You're in that kind of an exile situation as the nation of Israel was. Um, you know, to affirm that faith by your name, you know, hey, uh, wait confidently, uh, on God. So don't know if maybe the father was born into captivity and then Nehemiah later was born into captivity. And you get later in the book, if you really want to get critical about it, you'll see his whole genealogy, actually, who his, all his ancestors were. But um, in essence, if you're in exile, what can you do but wait on God to deliver and to receive comfort from the Lord. Just to get a sense of this, keep your place in, in Nehemiah, but the 137th Psalm. So when I think of uh, what would it be like for Jews in that exile? You know, quite specifically, we're talking about when they were removed from their homeland in Jerusalem and taken some eight, 800 kilometers away, that is, if you go as a bird flies, uh, to uh, this region where we would say Babylon is located in Iraq today. So just look at the difference between, uh, say, uh, Jerusalem and, and Iraq, and you'll see that, that distance, right? So... Um, uh, what, what would it feel like? What would it feel like to be a Jew 
uh, among all of those uh, which they call pagan because they were not God fearers. So what would it be to among uh, all of all those pagan nations with their pagan practices, their pagan um, beliefs and, and all those things, what would it feel like? Now we can recount the history of it. We, we certainly can. And we can know historically all of the facts that and the reasons why they went from here to there and all that, but, but to feel it, what would it feel like? Let me give you a sense of that. I like to use the 137th Psalm to give us a sense for what it would be like to live uh, in, in exile, would be the Jews. So notice this. It says, uh, 137.1, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. I was talking about the Jews who now had been you know, transported against their will, taken captive, their exiles in, in this strange place. It couldn't be any stranger than what they're familiar to, like the complete opposite of their culture, their beliefs, uh, their values. All those things have been rearranged entirely. Uh, we wept when we remembered Zion. This would be like Jerusalem and the temple and, and the, the feastal worship opportunities that, that they have during the course of the year. Uh, on the willows there, we hung up our lyres. And that's just very poetic for saying the, the lyres were used, you know, in, in worship and, you know, very, very vigorous worship the Jews did with very intense singing and joy. And now basically saying, whether literally or not, we, we've had to set those things apart because there's nothing to be happy about. There's nothing to be joyful about. We're, we're just um, completely separated from all those things that once brought us joy uh, and happiness, and then in verse three tells tells you really for or because because there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying this, hey hey Jews Jews sing us the songs of, go go ahead sing us the songs right could this be could this be any more painful than someone in your worst hour your darkest hour is saying come on let's see a smile. Let's see a smile on that face. Come on, come on, cheer up, cheer up. Right, and so this is what's happening. Verse four, then again, the, the Jews come back with this, this sort of you know, response. Well, well, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And then this commitment to God. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, met, let my right hand forget its skill. That, that's nationalism, kind of, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you get that? If you were carried away captive to a foreign place, and in your mind was not just the entire homeland, but this most special place where they worshiped God, you know, where they came together as Jews and they went to the temple and they, and they worshiped the Lord. And it says, so, so let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. It wasn't just because it was the homeland, but it's because what they did uh, in Jerusalem. And then verse seven now, what, what else goes with this? Uh, not just the remorse or the, the sense of being overwhelmed with despair at not, at not only being in this situation, but not being able to get out of this situation, then it turns to this anger. This, consider the anger here. He says, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, how they said, now, this is, they're in Babylon. They're in Babylon. Where are the Edomites? So the Edomites are not there in Babylon. But, but this is the collective uh, anger and the desire for God to render vengeance, you know, his vengeance upon these enemies, for the enemies of the people of God were the enemies of God. And so he's just, he's just literally spewing out this anger, and, he, and he, he basically says, you know, I want to know how angry I am about this? He says, I'm remembering the Edomites. If you go back through the Old Testament, you'll see that Edom, Edom was a nation that was basically predicated on destroying the nation of Israel. I mean, we can think of, uh, you know, um, the Palestinians, right? And we can go back in recent decades and how uh, Palestine has, it, ha, ha, the Palestinians had at its, at its charter, you know, the destruction of the nation of Israel. Well, so this, this is the Edomites. So it would be the south uh, Eastern kind of what would be uh, Idumea in the first century, in the time of Jesus, be Idumea. And a matter of fact, it was Herod. Herod the Great was an Idumean, and he's the one ordering the slaughter of the babies in Jerusalem. You know all this stuff. So, so they, they hadn't nothing been lost in terms of 
of Edom's, uh, and, and just, just to say when, when uh, the Israelites came out of Egypt, you know, and the, 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 the frail ones and the elderly were at the back of the line. You know, you don't put them out in front and push them, but they're at the back where they could get help. And guess who uh, the Edomites picked off first? And so the Edomites were just this perennial um, uh, force against uh, Israel wanting to wipe them out. So they're saying, let, let me just give you a sense of how I feel in my anger against these Babylonians. For he begins by recounting the severity of the Edomites and then saying, God, God, um, uh, uh, have, have your vengeance upon them because when the city was being destroyed, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. You know, the Edomites were, were crying out. That's what they wanted, just, just, just destroy it. And he says, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, you know, because of what God's vengeance would be on the nations in general. You can read about this in Isaiah and other the prophetic books. They go one by one by one by one through the nations and how that God had de determined to judge those nations. So Edom, Edom at the, the Edomites at the top of the list and then Babylon in there. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I was thinking back historically to the Warsaw Uprising, and this is uh, going back to August of 1944. It's an incredible thing. Uh, you know, I've been to the um, history of the Jews, thousand-year history of the Jews in Europe. This is in Warsaw. Uh, Museum of the uh, uh, Warsaw Uprising. It's an incredible, incredible uh, feat of Polish resistance, though they lost. And 150,000 of the 300,000 Inhabitants of Warsaw perished. So half the population's wiped out. 90% of all the buildings wiped out. And you'd say, okay, that's the severity of the Nazi regime and, and Hitler and the, Ger and the German army. But what, it, what added injury to insult was that the Russian army had advanced and was to come and join them in this resistance, but they stopped at the Vistula River, or the River Viswa. Stopped at Viswa, didn't cross to come and help. They literally stood there on the banks in sight of the atrocities and just watched this go on. This is, this is what, what, what the writer here is, is evoking, you know, all of this, all of this anger and, and fury. And if you think it's not anger and fury, he is saying, and this is, this is you know, sometimes it's called uh, an imprecation, right? So an imprecatory psalm would be when the psalmist adopts the wrath and anger of God, that mentality, and sort of uh, wishes that just, that just judgment of God upon his, his enemies, this is what we see here, and he says, blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. That's anger to the extreme, is it not? So, so all of this is, is going on, and he, you get, the, you get the backdrop of that, and we have to set it in a little bit better historical context to get the fullness of how we understand um, failure and the plight of these individuals and how we deal with it. Now, by the time you come to Nehemiah chapter 1, which is where we are, by the time you get all the way here, so much time has elapsed since those first days of exile in Babylon, you know, those, those days of which we read about in the 137th Psalm, in fact, by now, the, Babylons, the Babylonians are gone from the world stage, and the Persians uh, are, are now the, the ruling uh, empire on the planet. Um, there's been waves of Jewish exiles back into the land. They've returned uh, uh, in, in at least uh, two waves uh, by this point, a return to their favored city, Jerusalem. So... Uh, the Jerusalem, by now, by the time of Nehemiah, which, which is roughly, you know, this book is roughly about 445 uh, B.C., uh, the temple has been rebuilt at this point. Much of, much of Jerusalem has been, re been rebuilt. The temple has been rebuilt since about 520 B.C. Uh, so the first wave of those exiles back from the land was, was under Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel's name means the seed of, of Babylon, so you get a sense that uh, he was he was one who was was born in captivity 
Um, and then he was charged to, to go back to be the governor, still under kind of Persian authority, but, but to be the governor of this. And he, he rebuilds the, you could read Haggai and Zechariah and uh, both of those, and you'd, you'd get the role of both of those prophets and encouraging the people to uh, rebuild the temple. So he goes back in 536 BC, again, the temple rebuilt in 520, if you understand how that works with BC, the difference between BC and AD. Ezra, Ezra is involved in a second return, and Ezra and Nehemiah are rather contemporaries, but Ezra, whose name means helper, um, his exploits, of course, described in this previous book to Nehemiah, in the book of, of Ezra. And so where one is, is involved in rebuilding the temple, uh, Ezra is involved in rebuilding the people who had since returned to the land. Uh, they'd given way to, to mixed marriages, that is to say they married the people of the land which dishonored and displeased the Lord. Uh, this needed correction. Ezra was going to be the means of correcting that. So now the first, first wave of exiles back, let's rebuild the temple, let's get the worship right, and let's rebuild then the people under Ezra. And this is about 458 B.C. And if you've been keeping track of the years, you've noticed the following. Of course, I didn't mention you know, the, the additional three, three sieges of Nebuchadnezzar, which was 605, um, 596, and uh, 4. 86, or, or 586, sorry, uh, th those three uh, uh, sieges on Jerusalem that then brought about this uh, uh, first deportation. So there were, there, were, there were three deportations, 605, I said five, about 597, 586, three separate depor deportations to Babylon, and then there would be three returns, the first under Zerubbabel, 536, the second under Ezra, uh, 458, and then the third uh, under Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, so it's going to be number three because there's something else that needs to be rebuilt. So let's rebuild the temple, let's rebuild the, the people. Now there's something else that needs to be, He'd be the, the third and final wave of uh, exiles that would return to land. Nehemiah uh, would lead this. Uh, so, so in the days of, of Nehemiah's third return of the exiles, this is 445, the, the book is going to cover a period of like 445 to 444. As a matter of fact, I was just going, going through, uh, once again, even earlier, and just leafing through the books and marking all the references to the dating and the, and the months on the Jewish calendar, how much time elapses between this and this. And uh, it, it's, it's really amazing when you realize that um, how long that the walls of the city were down and the gates were burned in fire, of course, this is what? They're in great trouble and shame. And we'll, ex we'll explain what the shame is. But the, the relationship between how long things persisted in failure, basically failure, 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 ongoing and, and persistent failure to how short a time it was to basically uh, correct, correct this. So um, why, why is the time so significant? And, and certainly, I, I would say two reasons at least. But why it's so significant and why, if you're paying attention, for example, you start with, now, now it's happened in the month, month of, of Kislev. Okay, that's November, December, and then you get chapter 2, verse 1, and in the month of Nisan, this is March and April on the, on the Hebrew. So, so why? Why, why are this constant references throughout, and later on it'll say, and in the seventh book, and of course he's, he's making a distinction here between the beginning of the religious year, this is, this is Nisan, and then Tisri, the beginning of the um, uh, civil, civil year. Why is he marking all these? Like, why is it important, really? So I think uh, for at least a couple reasons, because what, uh, of what fallen walls uh, and burned gates represent? We saw the word shame earlier, right? Great trouble and, and shame. Uh, you know, if you have a wall of silly, city in the, in the ancient Near East, let's say it's every fortified city meant it was a power in that region. You think of Nineveh, for example. Think of Jericho, right? So, so this was what made them these little city-states in this region. And now you have Jerusalem, which was once fortified, which was once the dominant force in this region. And the, for the Jews, it says we, we are dominant uh, because of our God. But to the pagans, they would think because the walls are down, that God has been defeated. That God of the Jews has been utterly defeated, is weak, is impotent, whatever you want to say. That was the testimony. Although the Jews had gone back, they had 
uh, restored sacrifices, rebuilt the altar first, then they, then they rebuilt the temple. And you think, well, well, that's enough, right? But still, God was being dishonored uh, among the nations. Uh, a second reason is because we can know the duration of this degrade, disgrace and learn why. why. Why was Nehemiah, for example, we, we gave a description, then look at verse four and following. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned. I mean, I mean why? Why? I mean, you know, we get it. It's uh, the, uh, people in your homeland are, are suffering and they're in, you know, kind of relative suffering, you know, great trouble and, and shame. But certainly there, there's food, there's no famine, they're, they're living. We can read elsewhere where they rebuilt nice homes for themselves and, and, and all of these things. So it seemed like they were living. So what's the, what is the great trouble and the shame? It's because this is a perpetuated failure. They'd not yet address the failure. They'd sort of like, just, just let's just sweep it away. Let's just, but, but this is actual, actual degree, debris. Actual rubble. I mean, metaphorically, there's a lot of Christians that have this same. There's debris everywhere, but they haven't dealt with it. And they sort of are, are in this full, let's just move on mode. Let's just, let's just move on. It's a new day. Let's just, let's just move on. Um, so, so I think it's, it's interesting. What's literally true of Nehemiah, what's literally true of the people of God can also be figuratively true uh, in our lives as well. So, so you're thinking, well, they'll get to it eventually. You know what? Rebuilding this wall. They'll, they'll, they'll get there. They'll get there. Just, just be patient. God, God, really, you know, don't be too hard on them. Just, just be patient. Well, just calculate the difference between 586 B.C. and 444 B.C. 586, when they're first taken away, um, the first deportation, right, to now uh, 444 or 445 B.C., the time of Nehemiah, when he hears this, right? So, 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 so some folks were dispatched from the old country and, and came here to, to where the exile is. Don't know why, just says they were there. And he asked him, so how are things back there? And he, and he hears, well, the walls are falling down and the gates are burned with fire. And if you can calculate the difference, you're talking about 140, 142 years. Th that's a long time. Even five years, even, even 10 years, even 50 years, but 142 years. And so the people had been... Um, back in their homeland since 536, which means discounting the 70 years in, uh, you know, they've had 92 years to get, to get it done. Uh, the people had rebuilt dwellings for their own families. Just read Haggai chapter one and you, you'll get that. The people had uh, rebuilt uh, the altar, which, you know, was a, was a problem back in the time. Uh, because they were commanded to rebuild the temple. They rebuilt the altar, but were too afraid to rebuild the temple. They didn't do it. it, let, it let their, they had this habit, the Jews you know, had this habit, of sort of just neglecting the precise will of God in deference to, to their own. You know, that, that, I mean, that's not something unique to the Jews. <laughs> we, all, we all do that. But, but just to, just to get, get the focus right, we're talking about failure here, right? Failure. And maybe not the immediate failure of a person who was born in captivity, you get this, but one of the things that you'll see, and, and perhaps ne next week when we get to you know, Nehemiah's confession proper, what is he confessing? And he's going way back before his time. And later on in the book, you'll see, you'll see as, as well uh, that the people, the people in unison, this is just Nehemiah here in chapter one, where he begins to pray and confess out of desperation. But later on, it's going to be the people together are going to say, oh, and they're going to even go back to before the exile and all these things that precipitated the, the deportation to begin with. Um, so God was really bringing about a revival of repentance to get that which was obstructing God's plan and purposes out of the way um, so um, his will could be done so so Israel could reconstitute themselves in the region so the name of God could stand for something um, once again this has so so many applications let's say to the church today and and all these things upon what we might focus on when our uh, the name of God and the name of God being honored and magnified and at least the name of God representing the true God through our, through our lives. Um, so, 
so uh, look at the surroundings of Nehemiah, and you know we haven't got there yet, but he's you know he's going to go back. He's going to go back now, uh, and won't go through all that. But just imagine him now on the site. You know, goes back to Jerusalem, takes some people with him, and all these things. Begins to contemplate um, what what the next steps are, how to get this this massive uh, engineering project going, but. Um, Here's, here's all the debris he sees, all the debris, all the rubble, the fallen wall, the, the burned gate meant only one thing to the nations that the God of Israel was incapable of providing for and uh, protecting his, his people. And such a God as that is inferior than to all of those pagan deities of those nations around them. But, but there's another maybe more significant fact uh, regarding the, the piled uh, stones uh, should the people rebuild the wall? What, I mean, what would this mean, right? What, what, would, what would this mean? You think, it's a simple project. You know, come on, just, just put it on the to-do list. 142 years, why? Why? Why 142 years? Or why 92 years or whatever? Whatever figure, it's still a lot. Why, why, why? Um, but, but when you think, what would rebuilding that wall signal? At what cost? At what cost? So, so, um, uh, Artaxerxes could just say, Here, here's all the stuff. So it's not going to cost you anything except the sweat of transporting all the raw materials back in. And you have all the materials. They're just laying there, need to be put back in, in place, clean out the debris and all that stuff. So it had nothing, zero to do with the actual work, like they were lazy or something like that. But what if they were to rebuild that wall? I mean, what of their trust in Almighty God here? Because what they're thinking, well, well wait a minute. Um, what are we signaling to the nations, but we're refortifying? I don't, we just flip this a little bit and go to another period of, of history, back, back to World War II. <laughs> and you remember Churchill, right? Churchill and Chamberlain and and all these, and, and that, that whole buildup, you know, if you read Churchill's um, The Gathering Storm, you, you'll get his whole premise that he was trying to make to Parliament that, that uh, Herr Hitler, you know, Germany, is rearming. They're rearming. Of course, nobody believed him. Why would he do that? He, was, he, he, he signed the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, World War I is behind us. And come on, let, let's, let's stay away from all this war rhetoric. We don't want war anymore. And, and they, they, with great incredulity, said, no, no, uh, Hitler, certainly he wouldn't do that. And so he, here was the rearmament. You know, to flip this the other way, the Jews were basically saying, we're rearming. And we mean business. We're taking back this, this territory. And with every block, massive, you know, 20 ton stone they're putting back, back into the wall was a signal. It, it, it basically was signaling to the nations an invasion, a, an impending invasion. We are going to take back um, our land and we are going to restore our kingdom. So what do you think? Who wants to sign up for that work detail? You know, who, who wants to have enemies at the gates and even while they're building it, remember? They're being attacked, and, and if you, you check out the four principal, um, uh, what, attackers, they're coming from, and, and look at geographically where they're coming from, north, south, east, and west. This is where they're all, you know, they're literally going to be surrounded by enemies. If, they're, if they are going to fulfill God's purpose, if they are going to reestablish God's name among the pagans, it is going to cost them dearly. They're going to have to fight for it, which is a word that, you know, is getting a bad, bad rap today, right? This whole idea, but, but that's what they would have to do. They would have to, they would have to battle for it. It was going to cost them something. So as a result, for 142 years, or 92 years, however you want to do the math, they just said, you know what? Yeah, we get it. We failed, but you know, let's just live with it. You know, it's just, isn't it just easier just to live with failure than to do all the heavy lifting? No pun intended. Well, maybe a pun intended, but we don't want to do all this heavy lifting of fixing this thing. Let's, let's just, you know, it'll, it'll resolve itself somehow down the road. You know, why, why even bother with this um, at all? So uh, you just leave the rubble, just leave it laying there and learn to live with it. But we really have to take a good look at the, 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 the landscape 
you know, our landscape, the spiritual landscape. Uh, and you start really with, with what's all, all too familiar in your life. Um, you have a familiar way of rationalizing certain things about the past. You have a familiar way of, of justifying past behavior. You have a familiar way of excusing your present circumstances by, by faulting another. Does this sound familiar to, to any of us, right? So, so we get that. Um, yeah, so we'd be in good company, you know, if that's our mentality, or I'd probably say bad company, I suppose. But that's the, the Israelites. Um, shouldn't they have known better after 70 years of, of captivity? But yet, you know, there's a whole generation born in exile that didn't know anything about that prior life. They didn't know anything about Jerusalem. So when you read the 137th Psalm and all the, 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 the wailing, you know, the wailing that, that this evokes and, and the weeping and, and, and all such things, this would be for those people who, who first set foot uh, into Babylon, right? Because it was all so fresh to them. We remember worshiping at the temple. We remember migrating from throughout the country for the feast days and all the, the joyous singing and, and this um, uh, vibrant worship that we have. But then, but then later, later generate those born into captivity, they didn't know anything of that. What, what did they know of the homeland? Uh, nothing by personal experience, only by what the older ones could pass down uh, to them. Now, I'll tell you um, from Haggai, if I just go there for just a second, because I keep mentioning this book, Haggai means my, my feast or, or feastal. But Haggai chapter 1 and verse 2, now here's the thing. Ask any of them, why isn't this done yet? Now, this is with reference to the temple. This sat there for 16 years and nothing was done. Year one, year two, year three, what's going on? And so what was the common re re refrain Thus says the Lord of hosts. I mean, this is what God says, whether they said it verbally or in their hearts. Thus says uh, the Lord of hosts. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. You know, when, when, when you come to the time of, of, of Nehemiah then, you know, it's the same people. It, obviously, if it's not done what God wanted, if it's not done, then the only answer could be that you realize it has to be done it should be done, it needs to be done, but it isn't done. So why isn't it done? And the simple reason is because you think it's not time yet. It's not that you disagree with what God wants, it's just the timing of it. it just doesn't seem urgent enough. And we have no trouble with our, with our neighbors, you know, we have no trouble with the pagan nations around us because there's no wall. The minute we put up a wall, we have to get ready for war. The minute we put up a wall, we've got to arm for battle. Then we've got to have a strategy. The minute we put up a wall, we've got to defend this place. Isn't it just easier to leave, leave the rubble? Can you imagine them going around the city seriously and their, their donkeys or whatever, their beasts of burden are trying to step over this rubble and but listen, what, what becomes all too familiar to them is they actually became quite expert at climbing over the rubble <laughs> till the point is that that it, it, it's, it's like you come into a room and rather than hit your head because there's a low beam you you duck under it you know instead of like taking care of this arrangement so you don't have to keep ducking you just said you know I get used to it so it's second nature just 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 keep doing it and this was the juice and this this is true of our lives I mean there are things in our lives that that have become so familiar to us We've forgotten that they're abhorrent to God. You know, we've just forgotten and we wonder then why. And then we become critical of God because we're saying, where's your blessing, Lord? Where, where, where's your blessing in my, my life? And God so patiently, you know, just, just stands aside um, and wants to call something to our attention. So let's, let's finish here with uh, Revelation chapter two because we're talking about failure what to do, so we, we acknowledge, okay, we, God isn't about rubbing your face in failure, that's not what he's about, certainly the cross doesn't stand for that, would he have sent his son to die for us if he just wanted to rub our nose in failure, he knows failure is endemic to being human, we're going to fail, but it's what do we do when, when we fail, so you look at Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 through 7, we'll see uh, that the New Testament principle is identical
to that which is represented in the book of Nehemiah. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The seven lampstands really represent the, the seven churches. These little short letters are to seven different churches in Asia Minor. And he says, he says this, I know your works, your toil, your patience, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, you know, false teachers. Found them to be false. I know you are enduring patience. These are all good things, right? These are all commendations, great things. We, sh we should all be known for such things like this. I know you are enduring patiently. You're bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. You know, I imagine they'd say, wow, this is, this is awesome. <laughs> Good for us in Ephesus. But then look at verse four. But I have this against you. So all these commendations, but now a condemnation. I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had for me at the first. So he says, is, is, is this a correctable error? So here's a failure, but it's not final. So he says, this is, this is perfectly correctable. However, you have to do something. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, so there's going to be a consequence for perpetuating this kind of failure. There's going to be a consequence. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. It's simply you're going to take that lampstand, take it out of the circle by which the high priest, you know, is maintaining all, all the oil, trimming the wicks, making sure that they shine. In other words, making sure that the lamp that's situated on the lampstand is actually um, useful in the purpose for which it was placed there, to be a luminary. And so what is he saying to this church? He's saying that, that listen, if you don't, if you don't, remedy this, if you don't change this, if you don't make this right, you're just not going to be useful. He's not saying you're going to be shut out of heaven. He's not saying you're going to lose yourself. He's just saying you're not going to be useful to the degree that I want you to be useful. So this, this notion that, that you've, you, he says, I have this against you. Uh, so without getting all crazy in the, into the Greek here, the original, just understand the verb tenses. So he's saying, I, I have this continually against you, okay? So for 140 years or 92 years, God would be saying to the, the Jews throughout this period, I have this against you. I have this against you. Why? Because there was a failure and there was no attempt whatsoever to, to remedy that failure. So, well, well just, 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 just leave it. Just, just leave it and just, just keep going on. Well, here's a failure. And he points out what the failure is. And so un unless and until you fix that, then I have, he says, I have this continually against you. And then it's not, listen, just like with the Jews, it was collective. The whole nation. This is why Nehemiah, you know, 800 kilometers away from all of this could, could include himself. You know, God forgive me, right? And so here, uh, this is referred to, uh, this is plural here. All, all of you, against, against you all, um, he has this, this, that your love or the love of all of you, all of you, the love that you had for me at the first, you've abandoned. So, so when he said, uses the term first here, he's talking about its earlier version when the love for Jesus was paramount, right? So somehow that, the, the, Jesus had lost first place and been relegated someplace down below. And so, and he, he says this is true of everyone. Everyone's involved in this. Um, the difference in the verbs is, he says, I have this continually against you because at some point in the past, you did that. Right? And he has to tell us what that is. But it's as though they know Really, otherwise, why was he saying, now, now remember it, remember it, and then repent and do the first work. Get, get back to where my love is paramount. So there is something that's known to them, but not disclosed to us. Something that is um, a matter of historical experience among 
those believers in Ephesus, something happened among them by which love for Jesus was no longer primary. And it wasn't even that it's secondary or tertiary in whatever four and five are, I don't know. But, you know, whatever you go down further in the list. But what does he say? You've abandoned it. Not the verb for abandon. It's the same verb that we have to forgive. Now listen, we say that the, 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 the positive side of, of the verb is to forgive, to release, to let go. But the negative side is to, is, you know, to, to neglect something or to abandon something. But the imagery is still the same. When God forgives us, he abandons, he abandons those sins. He, he leaves those sins and it's guilt and it's shame. and all. It's, it's a tremendous verb. But here, here it's as though um, it, it would be like someone traveling and they go to the airport and they have their carry-on luggage with them and they get through security and then, of course, in today's world, if you left it, it wouldn't be left alone for too long, right? It, it would be an announcement. <laughs> Come get this, or the SWAT team would be surrounding it. But let's just say for the sake of argument, you left it there. That's the last place you can remember where it was. And now you know where to return and find it. It's that type of, aban of abandoning. So... Um, we get the same principle. Um, maybe, somehow, the church in Ephesus, relative to their love for Jesus, adopted this kind of um, familiarity. You know, or, or they got so involved, the most obvious would be, they got so involved for the things that they were commended for, that they, that they lost the number one thing that should have been the essence of who they... It, it would have been better that, that they had less doctrinal acuity. It would have been better that they, that they had less of all of those things above and had love for Jesus as being paramount. I mean, what, what if this was superimposed on the Christian movement today? How in love with Jesus are we? You know, or, or what's on our list that is, that is most important, especially our to-do list. What, what is it that's, that's, um, that's predominant? Um, I would just say that there are th some things that we can fail in doing or not doing because we've ignored it or neglected it. And it's okay. You know, it's okay. If somehow we can survive it. We can go on. There's some things you get, you get to make one mistake and that's it. I remember, I remember um, some years ago when we were in North Carolina, had, had the, the church plant there. Uh, I can remember going out to different places and just talking to people, knock, knocking on doors, talking to them. Uh, I think it was a, a mobile home park or something like that. And, and, and so there was a fella uh, sitting in there uh, watching, watching TV, you know, knock at the door. And I, I go and start talking to him, you know, just introducing myself uh, you know, maybe you've, you've heard on the radio, I, you know, I do this thing and then other, whatever, just having a conversation. And, uh, and then somehow the idea of God came up and the idea of, of um, who God is. And, and maybe he had some, some idea about his understanding of God that just didn't seem just and just, just didn't seem right. Maybe God was just too oppressive, you know. All, all those rules that are associated with being a Christian and all, all this. I can just remember this conversation, but not precisely. But I do remember um, him saying that, uh, you know, I have a son. You know, he tells me, and he says, um, the, the way I treat my son, I don't lay all these rules down to him because I love him. I don't lay down <laughs> any rules because I believe you learn from your mistakes. So it's better off to have no rules. Just let them make mistakes and learn from their mistakes. And I remember telling him, yeah, yeah, yeah. On some level, of course, that's true, on, on some level. But you do have to provide some boundaries, don't you? But I says, you know, on some level, that, that's true. But I says, what about those mistakes that you can only make once? Those fatal mistakes. I mean, what, what if your son gets into drugs, you know, for example, and then, and then he has an overdose? Yeah, but what, what's his lesson then? And when we come back to, to Christianity and the Christian life, 
Sure, Christians make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Sure, sure we know. And what we learn from Nehemiah or from, um, you know, these believers in Ephesus is that, hey, you know, um, that there is hope beyond failure. You can, you can learn. You can move on. Don't keep, you know, uh, climbing over the rubble until it just becomes all that all too familiar. Uh, but realize that you can, can learn something. And this is so evident. We get that. But to die, die by failing to accept Jesus as your Savior, <laughs> that's a mistake you can't come back from, right? So that's, that's the indication that, that to, to miss the whole mark of why God sent his son into this world to, to, to give us something that we don't deserve and to offer that to every man, woman, and child to fail to receive that and then to go out into eternity is not to get some second chance and a third chance and a fourth. These are the sobering realities of failure. That's one area of our life uh, that we do not want to fail. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Nehemiah as we just start to um, introduce ourselves, get acquainted with him, but we see the bigger picture of this idea of failure. Help us just to, just to not take this as a, as a, you know, a negative or a damper, uh, but, but an understanding of your grace and your mercy and your, your patience, your incredible long-suffering with us uh, to just under, understand that, yes, we are a forgiven people, but then it's also possible that we can um, have things in our lives that obstruct that relationship that we are to have with you, things that you've called us to, that, that uh, we are not about doing because we have allowed other things to be higher up on the, on the to-do list. So Lord, just help us to do a bit of searching, a bit of prayerful searching about your spirit. You know, put, put your finger on those things and realize that we can remember, we can uh, repent, and then we can be about doing. You know, change is, is possible for all of us. We don't have to live in this kind of prolonged state of failure. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that failure isn't final and that we can, in fact, um, still, still, um, you, you can restore, you can restore, as, as you told the prophet Malachi, you can restore all that the, that the moths have eaten. You know, you're, you're a great God of, of restoration. So we just come to you saying, Lord, I want to be used by you. And, and in order for that usefulness to take place, I, ha I have to be be there in your presence. And so, Lord, just help us do a little reordering um, to avoid the lack of blessing in our life and to see you use us in a, in a mighty way. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.